what the hell happened to movie posters, and to that end, cover art in general. Posters used to have this great artwork that would draw your eye to it. Even old video games had these amazing hand-painted covers, but now all we get is scowling gun-toting guy, or the new trend, constipated sports superstar. Although I'm not going to talk video game covers today, I'm going to focus on movie posters and just how lazy and generic they've become. Now keep in mind, I'm not going to talk about the quality of the films, just the artwork that's being used to market them. In the early days, movie posters were something that would grab your attention. Either the colors popped, the design stood out, or it just plain looked cool. Take a look at the original poster for Friday the 13th. The outline of the killer with the woods filling in the body and a group of potential victims. Along with the tagline, they were warned, they're doomed, and on Friday the 13th, nothing will save them. Ominous, creepy, and unique. What do they do for the remake poster? Jason Voorhees standing in the woods with the tagline, Welcome to Crystal Lake. Now the mindset was that they wanted the reboot to be for a new audience. If the potential audience had never heard of Friday the 13th before, they wouldn't know what Crystal Lake was, or who this guy was either. A similar problem was with the Nightmare on Elm Street poster. You have the original that has so many elements to draw you in, versus the reboot poster, which is just Freddy standing there. Instead of nitpicking individual posters all day, let me just focus on the worst of the worst. These are some of the most common movie poster styles out today. First up is a big one, teal and orange. Any graphic arts designer will tell you that if you take two colors from the opposite end of the color wheel, they'll complement one another. Green and red, yellow and purple, and of course, teal and orange. Now green and red is great for something Christmassy, but teal and orange works with just about anything. The contrast in color really does make it stand out. The problem with this? Well, being such a common theme, especially amongst the summer action blockbusters, you now have multiple movies all coming out around the same time with the same style poster. Even a list of movies online or in the store all look the same. No wonder people get fooled by the asylum. Next up is the giant floating head posters. I understand the need to promote the star power in your films, but this is just lazy. You take an element of the movie and fill the lower third of the panel. Then usually you put the star of the production front and center with the supporting cast covering the sides in descending order in accordance with their popularity. Or for a cool poster like Unstoppable, the image of a runaway train wasn't enough for the studio, so they had to squeeze in the heads of Denzel Washington and Chris Pine. The Scream films and the others from that mold did a slight variation on this with the floating heads in the background and the cast slightly staggered at the bottom. If it's a romantic drama, then usually it's two floating heads, most often over a beach. Or if it's a Nicholas Sparks movie, it's a close-up of two people about to kiss over a beach. Now, if your movie has big stars, of course you want the people to be aware that they're in your film. However, what if your main cast aren't well-known yet? Back in 2007, the general public really didn't know who Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox were yet. The studio already put out a teal and orange poster, so they followed it up with a floating head poster. Only since the stars of the movie were relative unknowns at the time, they put the floating heads of the robots on the poster. Yes, because Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, and Megatron are major players. Sometimes the floating head posters are even dumber than that. In the posters for X-Men First Class, you have these great black and white posters with the outlines of Magneto and Professor X. They stood out because of the contrast between the black and white. This wasn't good enough for the studio. They had to put Michael Fassbender and James McAvoy's heads in there in what looks like something done by a high school student using Photoshop for the first time. As lazy as the floating head posters are, the next ones are even worse. This is the main character's head or face with words on it. I like Jennifer Lawrence, but what does a close-up of her face with house at the end of the street do to make me want to see the film? The Seven Pounds poster tells me about a secret, and it's starring Will Smith. Anthony Hopkins shot his wife. yippee ki Mother Russia. The God of Thunder. A bunch of words. You will know her name? Is this before or after I need to remember his name? I know it's a TV show, but it worked. The worst of these is the string of Seth Rogen head posters. I think the guy's funny, but this face makes me not want to see the film. Posters have gotten so bad, it's almost like they have these templates and color palettes pre-made depending on the style of film. Got a quirky indie movie? Better break out the golden yellow. Animal movie? A cool blue, sometimes paired with green and other times with the white of the full moon. Action movie? Orange and white. If you don't want to do the orange and white combo for your action movie, you could always do the view from behind the character, where they're sometimes looking over their shoulder and usually carrying a weapon. 
The newer variation on this is guys standing in front of some huge obstacle they must overcome. Horror? Close up of an eye. Having a one for the eye makes sense. But the skeleton key? The grudge too? Got a thriller? Light blue, usually with a floating head slightly askew and often with someone running. Romantic comedy or something with a sexy element? The ever popular shot between a woman's legs. Speaking of romantic comedies, these are usually with the two leads standing back to back with the guy making a dopey face and the girl grabbing his tie or scarf to show that she's really the one in charge. The face with words spun off into the face with eyes covered, usually depicting a dramatic thriller. There are a few others that aren't as common, like the blank movies where a bunch of actors stand around and usually one of them has a shirt with a catchphrase on it. There's also the actors in a box surrounded by more boxes, or the ever-popular mosaic. Oh, and Eddie Murphy is contractually obligated to raise one eyebrow in every poster. So where does this leave us? The problem is basically the studios dump so much money into the production and the trailers. Well, not so much the trailers themselves, but the payouts of what they're attached to. For example, a 30-second spot during the Super Bowl costs $4 million. Putting the trailer on primetime TV and having it air every commercial break can easily rack up the millions. So by the time the studio allocates the money for the poster that's attached to the film, they usually give the artists the least amount of time and the least amount of money to turn out anything worthwhile. I miss the days when posters and cover art were something exceptional. Something you would frame and hang on your wall and not just a dull 5-minute Photoshop class project. Right now there's fan-made movie posters that are blowing the ones the production made out of the water. And the minimalist ones are a little overdone, but some of them are flat out awesome. Putting the quality of the films aside, look at it this way. Would you rather have the hand coming out of the grave poster of the original Evil Dead versus the bland, the most terrifying film you will ever experience poster of the Evil Dead remake? I guess all I'm asking for is a little more creativity and just a hint of effort. But I do realize I'm asking this of the same people who just greenlit It's a Wonderful Life 2. Because that's what we need.